One of my favorite parts of taking rhetoric and composition classes back in college was uh, the rhetorical tropes or figures of speech that I got to learn. They were new big words, you know, words like hyperbole and litotes and, and even words like anaphora. And not only were they big words that I got to learn, but then on top of that, after I learned the concept or the figure of speech, I could add more style to my written words, to my spoken words, and just give myself a little bit more flair. So in this class, you know, there are dozens of these figures of speech, but I think there's a few of them that you can probably employ inside of your first speeches uh, to really add a little bit more stylistic flair and a little bit more power to the words that you choose to use inside of your speech. Now, a lot of these figures of speech can be broken up into categories. So the first category is comparisons. Now, I'm sure most of you folks have probably heard about metaphors and similes. So they're comparisons between two unlike objects. So as a metaphor goes, I could say you are a shining star, right? Which is a comparison between you and a star. Or I could say you shine as bright as a star, which would be a simile since it uses the word as. Please note that all similes use either the word like or they use the word as. Another type of comparison that happens as far as figures of speech are concerned is personification, where we extend human-like characteristics to inanimate objects. So let's say you're doing a speech about climate change, you might describe the planet as Mother Earth, giving it extra human characteristics to help out with further pathos appeals. Oftentimes when I hear speeches about animal cruelty or animal rights, we also see a lot of personification, people extending human-like characteristics to these animals in order to personify them so that the pathos appeals work a little bit more effectively. Now moving outside of the world of comparisons, we can talk about different figures of speech that deal with issues of proportion. Now I don't know about you, but I've got one of those friends, every time they catch a fish, it's this big. Every time they get in a fight, oh, I almost died, right? Oh boy. But you might have those hyperbolic friends that when they tell stories, they overly exaggerate what happens just to add a little bit more effect to it. And you can do this too. Inside of your speeches, you can go overboard, right? You can hyper exaggerate what you're trying to say to bring more attention to it. You could go the other way though. Understatement has power too, or what we call litotes, where you can just understate something like how much I enjoy giving these lectures at 1045 at night. Moving on to rhetorical questions, <laughs> you can always ask questions to your audience. And I encourage you at the beginning to actually ask questions, get a show of hands, get some audience engagement. But as you're going throughout your speech, you can also ask rhetorical questions. These get the audience thinking. And oftentimes if you ask a rhetorical question and then answer it, you can complete a deductive syllogism, which we'll talk about a little bit later on throughout the course of this class. So you might ask the audience, hey, do you folks think you're gonna get an A in this class? Well, if you do, let me show you how, right? I can ask you a rhetorical question and then I can answer it. Very powerful figure of speech. Now, we also have figures of speech that have to deal with issues of repetition. And now, repetition is very key in public speaking. As of right now, you folks are repeating all of your main points in your preview statement. You're going to tell us what you're going to tell us, right? Here's my one, two, three. And then you move into the body of your speech and each topic sentence is repeating the main points. Point one, point two, point three, and then you repeat yourself at the end. When you get to your conclusion, you review your main points. Today we talked about one, two, and three. And why do we do this? Because repetition equals persuasion. Repetition equals persuasion. Repetition equals persuasion. <laughs> but there are more specific aspects of repetition that you can employ inside of the text of your speech. The first of these is alliteration. This is the repetition of a consonant sound over and over again. So let's say, for example, you're talking about light bulbs. You know, you might organize your speech into three points. You could talk about the person, how Thomas Edison was, who he was, how he discovered it, etc. You could talk about the process that he went through, how he stayed up all those late nights working hard, trying to craft all the filaments that went into the light bulb. And then finally, you could talk about the product, right? The final incandescent light bulb that we see so much around in today's day and age. So you've got the person, the process, and the product, something that I think I've mentioned in an earlier lecture as well. If you repeat a vowel sound over and over again, you have what we call assonance. And then finally, I'd like to talk about a little bit about some figures of speech that have to deal with issues of balance, because we always want to balance our points out pretty well. And parallelism is kind of the catch-all, right? Where you see, you know, balanced clauses, balanced words, balanced phrases. So like the, the saying, uh, easy come, easy go, right, would be an example of what we call parallelism. 
A little bit more advanced version of this is what we call anaphora, where you have the repetition of a phrase over and over again. So Julius Caesar's, I came, I saw, I conquered, right, would be an example of what we call anaphora. And then finally, my personal favorite, antithesis. This is where you have a repetition of a structure, but you invert it. So what would be an AB structure goes AB, then BA. And the famous example of this is John F. Kennedy's, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country.